Okay, well, first off, uh, I want to thank the few of you here who found your way up here. Um, that's, uh, that was the first challenge this morning. Um, the, um, my name is Brent Roman, and I'm here to tell you about the, um, the environmental sample processor, which is a microbiological laboratory that, um, that we at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute deploy, uh, deploy in, in the oceans of the world to, uh, to, study micro to study microbes in the water. Um, and what you're viewing here is an image of a few of the team actually hoisting one of these units off the end of a, uh, off the end of a ship for deployment. We'll talk uh, briefly about what the ESP, the, the environmental sample processor, what it is and, um, and what it does, how it works, and why we built it. Um, and then we'll go into a more detailed discussion about how we got to the point where we could, where we could deploy this kind of unit for uh, six months to a year on, a, on the batteries that you see below. And that turned out to be a, an evolving challenge that took many years to, uh, to accomplish. So um, let's get started. First off, some background. Um, a, lot of, a, a number of you, in fact, I overheard a couple of people talking about the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, so uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium was uh, founded by, um, by uh, David Packard's two daughters. So she had three daughters, and two of them uh, became marine biologists. And so David Packard to, uh, to, uh, challenged his daughters to come up with, a, with some project that would really make a difference in their, in their chosen field. And they, um, that project became the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And the, the fundamental difference between, or what's really kind of unusual about the Monterey Bay Aquarium is that it, it showcases local species found right there in the Monterey Bay itself, as opposed to bringing in a lot of exotic species. So it encourages, encourages people to appreciate the ocean they're near, as opposed to viewing it as a zoo. Um, but as you may also be aware, uh, David Packard also was running Hewitt Packard at the time, and so he was, he was um, a very, uh, he was an engineer's engineer, and he was really disappointed and frustrated with the quality and the sophistication, or lack thereof, of the instruments that were being used to study the ocean. And so he resolved to, uh, to found the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, which is separate from the aquarium, whereas the aquarium is about, is about art outreach and education uh, about, the, about the ocean, the Research Institute is more about getting engineers and scientists, putting them together in a, in a, and working, and so they can work together closely to improve the instrumentation and the, and the tools that, that scientists have to study the ocean. The Monterey Bay, for those who aren't familiar with the geography, it's about 100 kilometers south of San Francisco. Um, and Monterey itself is at the south end of the bay. Um, both, the, both the aquarium and the, research, and the research institute were located there on the, in Monterey. But very soon, the research institute was moved to Moss Landing. Monterey is a town of about 30,000 people. Moss Landing has 700 people in it. There's nothing there. There's a harbor, a few fishing boats, that's it. What we have, however, is one of the largest marine canyons in the world. Um, and this, this amazing underwater geography makes it possible for a scientist taking a boat from Moss Landing to be in 2,000 or even 3,000 meter water and get back in time for dinner. So it's excellent, an excellent opportunity to study the deep ocean, and that's why we're, we're, we are located where we're at. Come on. The group, I'm, the group I work with at, at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, which I'll call Ambari for short, um, the group I'm, at, at, I'm with at Ambari studies plankton in the ocean, the microbial ocean. The plankton supply over half of all the world's oxygen. They provide the base for the, for the, for the ocean's food web, and they, reg, they, regulate the, all this, they regulate the CO2 in our air, just as, just as trees do in the, on land. But they also have some, some rather perplexing um, negatives. One of them is that they regularly will bloom, and often when they bloom, they will secrete neurotoxins. And these neurotoxins get, get first consumed by shellfish, then, then, they, then as other animals consume the shellfish, they get concentrated up the food chain, until finally you can res, you, they can result in these large fish die-offs, and, and, and not only do they affect fish, but they also can affect birds and mammals. Um, 
Now, traditionally, the, the, the problem here is traditionally, these, when these kind of uh, intense blooms occur, they discolor the water, making it kind of a reddish brown. That's why we typically call them red tides. But not all red tides are dangerous. Sometimes you have these massive algae blooms, and there's no, there's no poison. So to determine this, so we don't sound a bunch of false alarms, we, uh, traditionally what you would do is you'd send a water sample to a lab on shore, and in a few days you get the all clear, or you get the indication that yes, you have, a real, you have problems with, with poisons in the water. The trouble, of course, is by then the damage may be done. So the, so the, inter, the environmental sample processor was initially designed to, uh, to detect those sorts of red, those sorts of harmful algal blooms in hours as opposed to days. By, by, by not only sampling the water, but actually performing some, some analysis right there in, in situ. So the, the fundamental problem, uh, aside from all the processing and all of the, all of the neat robotics that, are in, that you can see here, the fundamental problem is to put the, the, in, the sample processor where it needs to be in the ocean and to keep it there. And for that, we have various moorings. This is, one, this is one of the first ones Ambari created for use in the, in the Monterey Bay, which is a fairly sheltered environment, not a lot of, not, not very strong waves. So in this case, we were able to put the ESP right about 10 meters below the surface, which is where the algae is that we want to sample. And, and all we have is a simple, um, uh, there's, a, there's a, a, um, an underwater cable, about 15 meters, goes up to a float, and, there, and we're close enough to shore that we can just use a regular cell modem to communicate in, in, uh, in this particular environment. Development on this began in 1996, so this has been a long time coming. Um, and the key innovation that, was that happened about, in, about the turn of the century was, was the creation of these pucks. These are, these are filter pucks. Each, each of these represents a pair. There's a top and a bottom, and each of them snaps together. They all have different internal dimensions, different internal and, and different functions. Some filter raw water. Some preserve, the, some preserve animals so that they can be later studied in a lab. Some actually facilitate processing and gen, uh, for genetic identification of species, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But they all have the same, once they snap together, they all have the same exact external dimensions. And that's what facilitates the robotic handling. So we can build a robot that essentially is a jukebox for handling these pucks and, and shifting them around in position inside the inside of the the, uh, in the sample processor. All right. We'll see a very quick movie about what it, how it works in practice. First thing it has to do is to get a puck and clamp it in position. Getting, and then once it's clamped into position, we start drawing raw water from the outside through the filter in the puck and that thereby we collect cells on that filter. The next part is to lyse those cells, to heat them, and to chemically treat them so we break open the cells. Now we have this extract bug juice that we can then spread over another puck that is treated with a special filter that has uh, spots on it for, with different DNA markers. Those DNA markers are chosen usually so that they can, they, can, um, they can be unique for specific species of interest, specific algae that we're looking for. And in the end, you get this monochrome image, which we, which we then radio back to shore. Fiduciary marks on that image show, uh, allow us to, to correlate individual spots or groups of spots with specific um, specific, uh, specific um, algae that, that we're interested in, or other species. A lot of people have gotten involved in funding this, uh, um, and uh, we'll, we can go on here. So let's look a little bit at the, um, at the robotics itself. What makes this, you know, the nuts and bolts, what makes this all possible? The, the ESP consists of about 10 servo motors, uh, small servo motors, and uh, eight uh, rotary valves. Uh, we've got about 20 solenoid valves. Here you can see uh, a, um, a solid model of the, of the arm, the robotic arm, that is, sh that is moving pucks from the storage carousel where they're stored in large stacks, about 132, uh, and we move them from these clamps where they're processed, where, the, where we can actually draw water or, or other reagents through the, through the filters, and then putting them back in the carousel once they've been processed. And this is just a cutaway of that clamp, one of the clamps. So, the ESP is not just for detecting algae, although that was what it was originally designed for. 
um, we, by, by simply changing the chemical markers that, we're, that we put on those, on, those, uh, on those pucks, we can detect not only algal species, but we can detect deep water uh, bacteria, and, uh, and also we can detect human pathogens. So to detect the, uh, we put the ESP in some deep water deplo deployments as, uh, as well, and we're not gonna talk a lot about those, but this one in particular, this is actually a, a, a one meter wide titanium sphere um, and this is rated down to 4,000 meters. So, in the, so we drop this down to the bottom of the ocean and we start looking for deep water bacteria. Um, another application for the ESP that's become popular in the past few years has been water quality. Um, things like, uh, you might have heard of some of the problems we've been having in the Great Lake regions with, uh, with, with uh, contaminated water due to, due to algae and also due to, to human, um, human pathogens in the water. So we, we put the ESP on a pier and, and, in, and just draw the water up from the surface. Now in these kind of applications, power isn't so much of a problem. Usually, even, on, even in the case when we go on the bottom of the ocean, we can bring a lot of batteries or we'll have a cable in place. Um, but our most common, still our most common deployment mode is these shallow water deployments for you looking at algae in, in, in um, the Monterey Bay or other coastal areas. In this case, the only, th the only power we have to work with is our battery, and, and, that, um, and, and in this case, we're really about, it's really about waiting for the algae to come to the ESP. We're in, we have, so we have to be able to stay on station and simply wait until the environmental conditions indicate that we should take a sample. Keep in mind that the ESP only has a certain number of pucks, it has a certain number of reagents, so it's not just battery power that we have to manage, we have to manage the um, all, of the, all the other consumables as well. We wanted to keep this out for, about, for as long as six months, because that was the duration of a typical season. And when it's deployed, you can see in these images what, we, what we're seeing here is some of the team are actually dropping that core ESP you saw on the previous slide. They're dropping it into uh, the sealed container. Uh, this is hoisting that over, this, over the back of the ship. And finally, we have a diver that will, ch that will move, remove some pins and get everything checked out. Once we drive away from it, we don't interact with it for the next few months. That's the goal. So you might think we use some really exotic battery technology. This is it, alkaline batteries, 360 D cell batteries. We looked at, we've looked at other technologies, but we keep coming back to this one because they're really energy dense. Most people don't realize that alkaline batteries have as much energy per weight as your, as your lithium ions. They just can't be recharged. So, uh, but, but on the other hand, they're extremely inexpensive. They are recyclable, so this is what we end up using. We, we have two of, these, um, two of these containers, each of them weigh almost 40 kilograms, and each one has 180 of these D cells in it. So each one is three kilowatts, three kilowatt hours. The total, the total energy budget for all the months we're gonna be deployed is six kilowatt hours. So our first concern when we're doing this is trying to um, minimize the amount of energy that we use to actually process pucks when we were working, when we were actually doing the sampling and doing the analysis. And to that end, one of the first things we ran into was we've got these 10 servo motors. And, and, and we're trying to do, remember, this, we're, only, we're a small group. We're trying to do this. Uh, we're, we're only going to make a, a few, we have a few dozen of these that we're going to make. So we're not doing big production runs. We're trying to minimize the amount of, the amount of new engineering that we have to do. Um, but unfortunately, we discovered that, at least in 2002, when we, did this, when we, did, when we first did this design, that all of, the, all of the microcontrollers that were, that were designed for uh, DC servos, they had a quiescent, they were using buses like CAN and RS-485, and they had quiescent power in the watt range. And so if we had 10 of those things, we would have a 10 watt quiescent load, which would blow our budget very quickly. So we developed our own, microcon our own microcontroller uh, that, that uh, servo controllers, and, and we got that down to 70 milliwatts per every two motors. Now we had this sort of under control, less than half a watt for, for control of the motors. And that told a pretty good story because to do one of these, when you did one of these HAB identifications where we're trying to identify harmful algal bloom, bloom species, that takes four pucks, about three hours to do the whole thing, and we only consume 25 watt hours in all that. 
And, we only, and, and remember, we only have 33 uh, sets of these pucks because we only can hold, store 132, 132 pucks anyway. So when we look and do the arithmetic, we're using about 800 watt hours to do all the processing we need to do. That's if we, when, we, when the ESP was put in the water, if it just started processing pucks and didn't do anything else. Okay. The trouble is, of course, we, have, we have clearly have enough battery capacity for that, but the problem is the waiting game, and that's what kills us. We don't, wanna, we don't want to uh, just suddenly, we could consume all of our pucks and reagents with, uh, in a week or less, but we want to be out for, for as much as six months. And to do that, we, we're gonna, we're, we're, we try to choose when we take our, our samples, when we burn our reagents, to, for, uh, when, the, when the environment, when the chlorophyll, the temperature, the salinity, we want to choose the time so that when, when these environmental sensors indicate that we're likely to have algae present in the water right now, that's when we want to take a sample. So, that, so our, our, um, our main processor stays awake and, continues, and continuously monitors these environmental sensors to, um, to determine when it should best take, when's the best time to take the next sample. Scientists also want, want to be able to interact with the ESP at any time. If they see some, th something interesting on a, on a satellite photo, for instance, that indicates a bloom is, gonna, is present, they might want to fire off a sample just on the basis of that. So in the end, we end up with a system that, drew, that draws about three watts while we, were, while we were idle. And keep in mind, this is designed in 2002. In 2002, we went out and we, didn't, we really didn't want to design our own processor board. So we went out and found what at the time was the, about, the, about the lowest power option we had. Which, and at the time, only a few companies were putting ARM processors on a PC-104 bus. This board is our motherboard. It's a custom board. This board is an off-the-shelf product. And um, this was a lot better than the Intel, uh, the Intel products we, we typically had at that time. But it still was much too, much too high power for, um, for our purposes. We were burning basically 75 watt hours a day. And when you do the arithmetic, we only could stay out for a little less than 70 days. And we burned through that whole five, the five kilowatt hours that we had available. So this, we, this is far short of our goal. And what are we going to do about that? Well, it turned out not to be as bad as you might think. It was, this 70 days was enough to do a lot of good science. Um, and in practice, if you can remember what the ESP is, 10 servo motors, a bunch of robotics. Do you think it worked the first time? <laughs> Reliably for months at a time? No. Um, we were lucky if we got three weeks, initially, if we got two, three weeks, we were really happy before something jammed or something leaked. Um, but after, after, about, uh, after a few years, it got to be pretty, pretty reliable. We got to the point where, typically, our main concern was, well, we can't stay out longer because we don't have enough batteries to do the job. So, it, so finally, and after 12 years, we finally turned around and, and bit the bullet and said, look, I, I was looking for a processor on the PC-104 bus because we didn't want to change everything. I was looking for a processor that I could just drop into place on that PC-104 bus and would get us lower power consumption. In the end, we kind of had to make our own. Um, we didn't make it from scratch. We took a DIM module that was, that's produced um, by embedded artists. Um, and we took that very low power uh, ARM module and we mounted it on our own PC-104 carrier board. Um, that became a drop-in replacement for the, uh, the, the, the previous um, board. And it had dramatic, obviously, you know, 12 years is a long time in processor evolution, especially if you, have the, if you, especially if you get to design the carrier board yourself. So we went from almost 2.5 watts to a quarter watt for idle, uh, Linux idling. And that's full up Linux. It's no, uh, you know, 64 megabytes of memory. We're not really cutting any corners that way. Um, now we have a system that even with the radio uh, uh, and the rest of the system up and running, we're looking at one watt for our idle power while we're, while we're monitoring all of the environmental, all the environmental sensors that we need to. And lo, we're there, 200 days. And, um, and that was a great accomplishment. Everybody's quite happy about that. But we have to take a step back and look at how we did it and, and the limitations of it. One, of the things I, one thing I'm going to show you in a moment is that we aren't the only people using the ESP. In, in our environment, the ESP is in a fairly um, protected bay. We don't have to cope with large, heavy seas. We can simply have a straight cable up to the, up to the float 
Um, and and, that, and we'll, one of the ways we keep the power consumption down is we run RS-232 over that cable, which you think, RS-232, my god, who does that anymore? But for oceanographic research, it's often a good choice. Um, it's very low power, it's very, uh, it, and, and, it, and you can run it a long distance if you're willing to slow it down. But what we found is, while we could run it that 15 meters or so that we needed to, we couldn't run it 12, we couldn't, for instance, go 20 meters on that cable. Just the, um, and, and another thing to mention is that the spec on RS-232 is ridiculously, if you ever work with it, it's ridiculously conservative. They'll tell you that, if you look at the spec, it'll tell you that we really should only be able to run this at about 19.2 k baud, but in fact, we run it at 115 k baud. It's just ridiculously conservative. But we are at the practical edge. Well, our collaborators at, on the east coast of the United States a, a, a large oceanographic institution called Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, they were early adopters of ESP technology. They wanted to deploy it, and they did deploy it off of, regularly off the coast of Maine, uh, and that's a much rougher environment. They couldn't put the ESP at 10 meters. If they did, it would be pummeled by the waves. It wouldn't last, it wouldn't last a month. It would, just be, it would just be destroyed in the seas. Um, so they have to put it on a larger mooring about 20, 25 meters below the surface. Now they have a problem. They've got, they are, the, the algae aren't there. The algae are still way up above. So they, they developed a system with a stretch hose, a rubber hose that connected this larger float. And when they needed to do, to do a sample, they actually have to pump the water from the top to the ESP and, and run it through the processing. They, they, you know, they also want their, uh, their, their environmental samples uh, uh, sampling, their, like the temp, uh, what did I do? They also want the environmental sampling up here on the surface as well. Okay, to do this, they have to go through this stretch hose and that has a cable in it. That cable is spiraled up the stretch hose. You can't have a straight cable because if you, if you had a straight cable, when the, when the hose stretched, it would just break it. So that cable is 65 plus meters long. It's terrible in terms of electrical properties. It won't pass anything like ethernet. It won't, it's too long for RS-232. Um, they ended up using DSL, which is, uh, you guys might remember, a decade ago. Um, that killed their power. Basically, they, they now are using all their power for the DSL and Ethernet uh, translation there. Um, so even, if, even when we retrofitted these units with a, with a new low-power CPU board, it wasn't, the, it wasn't relevant because we went from 8 watts to 6 watts, and they went from 60-day duration to 80-day duration. It really didn't get them much. And just to reiterate, this is kind of the take-home message, if I have a take-home message from this talk. It's that when we start looking at processors that are in this sub-watt range, down in the half watts and more, we can get that today. But at that point, we have to rethink how we connect those processors. Because we, even something as ubiquitous as Ethernet becomes a huge power hog relative to the actual processors. Ethernet, a, a one gig link or a 200 base T link, that's a watt. Um, that's four times more than our processor is using. Now you can slow it down, you can, go, you can go back to the old 10 base T that nobody uses, it helps a little bit. But the point is that these, these high speed serial links are a real problem. So we also, we worked with another um, institution, Scripps, over, at, uh, over in San Diego. Scripps uh, want, uh, we wanted to, uh, they had the same problem, they wanted to put the ESP off the west coast, they needed to keep it lower, and so they, they opted for the stretch hose as well. But in this case, um, we put these, we put the, um, I'm sorry, in this case, we used RS-422 to go up and down the stretch hose. That's a variant of RS-232 that, that allows you to go further. It draws a little bit more current, but it allows you to get the job done. Um, and that looked like, one of the, the main reason for this particular mission was to, um, was to get a six month, um, a six month, time series of the evolution of algae off the coast. So that was one of the main goal, that was one of the primary goals for the mission. What happened was we're hanging this, uh, this ESP literally in a parking lot. This is hanging from, in a parking lot. This is a, t a 10 meter stretch hose. And it's hanging like it will hang from the float uh, when it's deployed. And as we're testing this thing, we're finding out, if you, ever, if you ever looked at bungee jumping, you know how sensitive the system is to mass. So we find out that, guess what? We can't have two battery packs. You don't get that. If we do that, we're going to break this thing. The only thing we could do, when we had about a month before the deployment, the only thing we could do was take off a battery. And then I'm just 
what do I do now? Because I, I, had, I just had my budget. I was, I, was, I was able to make it. But now we went from having five kilowatts for that idle power. Now we only had two kilowatts for that idle power. And we're going to be depleted in just, 65, in just about 85 days. So the first thing I thought was, well, let's do something quick. Maybe we can just suspend the CPU to RAM. And again, this is, this is one of these issues where when, you, when you're doing a cell phone, a two-watt processor, you can suspend a RAM, and you'll save a lot of power. Uh, you'll save maybe tw 20 to 1. But when you take a quarter-watt processor and you suspend a RAM, you don't save that much because the total proportion of the amount of, of energy you're using to actually keep the RAM image refreshed is a fairly big part of the total. Um, so in this case, doing that would only give us about 15 days more duration. We'll get, from a, get to 100 days. We're still short. Well, let's, just, let's think about suspending the disk, at least briefly. And the usual problem here, we only have an SD card. It's going to be slow. We're going to have problems with flashware as we do this hundreds of times. But the real stopper was the 2.6 kernel that we had in, in, uh, at the time um, just didn't implement it didn't implement it. And on the ARM kernel, the ARM side has no code for that. And I wasn't about to try to make hibernation work on the ARM. So um, that, that was stopped right there. So at this point, it's time, for, uh, it's time to kind of punt. Went back to the scientists and I said, well, look, you want six months. You just took away half my energy. <laughs> Let's make a deal. <laughs> so I got them to agree that, if we, that for this particular deployment, we could have the whole system be time-based. Just have the system come up at specific times and run the processing. Um, for this particular deployment, that was deemed acceptable. But the, what they, what they, what they um, insisted was that the system be able to be woken at any time from a radio command. So if they see something really interesting or they're going to take a boat out there and, and, and ground truth it, they're going to interact with the system with the boat, they can wake it up. Well, if we have, but the radio, if you recall, draws about a half a watt. So in fact, that's become the power hog in the whole system. So how am I going to, if, if, so I need, I need to power management. I need to power manage the radio, because even if I do all this and I switch everything off, just the radio is going to be a 140 day duration. We're close, but not there. So um, I looked at what we'd have to do to, to address that. Turns out, as in, oh, oh, you'll see in oceanographic systems, we're about 10 years behind the times. I think you're seeing that here. Um, these radios are the guts of 2G modems. Uh, they, they're the guts of 2G flip phones. If you remember your 2G flip phones, they could sit on the, on the counter, and if you didn't use them, they'd work for a week. They had really good standby. Turns out these, these modems had that standby mode buried in their AT command sets. Found that, and then, and then we, put the system, we put them into that mode. And you get this odd situation where it has no data connection, but we can use, the, we can use these modems as pagers. We just send, we call it like it was a voice call, and the modem outputs literally ring, the old-fashioned AT command, the old-fashioned AT ring. That made it possible for our microcontroller here, with a little clever electronics, we have the microcontroller able to monitor the output of the modem after the, this microcontroller is very limited in what it can do. But after the host pro, as the host processor is shutting down, it, t it puts the radio into the standby mode. The microcontroller then is just monitoring it for a ring. And it doesn't know why it's happening. It just knows, I saw ring. And when it sees ring, it powers the, everything back up. Now that gets you an impressive, well for us, impressive sleeping um, power, power consumption. Now we're down to 200 milliwatts. We can stay out for more than a year. But of course, we gave up a lot. We can't mo we're not monitoring our sensors. So that was a, that was a, a real trade. This is just going on how, how it, the system powers back up. The only really tricky part here is we actually have some muxing electronics so that we can mux the, the serial port from the microcontroller to the host processor. But other than that, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Final mooring I want to talk about is uh, a really a nice one that I thought that the University of, uh, of Washington put together. And they, they uh, wanted to monitor, uh, they wanted to deploy ESPs, and they have been deploying ESPs for the last couple of years off of Seattle, off the coast of Seattle. And again, same problem. They can't, they're, out, they're, out, they're not in a protected area, so they're gonna, they have to deal with wave action. They have to get the ESP down below 20 meters. But, but rather than use a stretch hose, they got wise, and they realized that the stretch hose is quite expensive. Uh, and, and instead, they just used a really long Cat5 rated cable. And that turns out to be a good choice for a lot of reasons. One is, it's Cat5 finally. So we can, run the, we can run Ethernet over this cable if we really want to. Why not? Well, 
Ethernet isn't, we saw how we could run Ethernet slowly for a half a watt, and it would, we could make that work. But what you find out in practice with Ethernet is you need a computer at both ends. Because we can't just plug a serial device into an Ethernet cable. We have to have a, another, another computer out there to do the breakout. And, and that tends to, be, and, we, and we need a cell modem, which now instead of being a modem is going to be a cellular router. Those devices typically use two, three watts. And if you shop real hard, you get it down to two watts. So really, that would, that would cost us add another, another three or so watts to the total system. Uh, that we're back, we're back into this mode where we don't have enough power to, to stay out as long as we want. So I got this idea. I've had it kicking around for a while. Uh, why not use USB? If we, have this, if we have this cable, I actually tried this with the old, with the old um, uh, stretch hose, and it failed miserably because the cable simply couldn't support the high bandwidth. But if we've got a Cat5 cable, why not just run USB up it? Well, the ob obviously, aside from the, aside from the the obvious issue of distance, we're going to use a little bit more power. But we get what we get there is we could put Wi-Fi on the float, we can put weather instruments on the float. It it allows us to put whatever it allows us to have expandability up on the float, and we don't have to have multiple computers. We have everything driven by the ESP down below. But the big problem here is we need to span 40 meters. We're not going to do that with USB, but we have Cat5, and fortunately there are a lot of devices. Uh, there, are, there are a number of, uh, of, a, of Cat5 USB extenders on the market. Um, they're not that expensive. Some of them are quite unreliable. Um, uh, but we found, uh, we found this one from Icron that, that reliably goes through 50 meters of cable. And this system worked pretty well. It doesn't support high-speed USB. But as you find out, in, when you start analyzing these systems, we don't care about high speed. All we care about is power. And, so, and 12 megabits a second is plenty fast for us. Um, this worked well. We had to make a, a change to the actual. We had, to, we had to dig into this device and change it a bit because we had to share our cable with other units, other, um, other systems on the mooring. So we only had access to six of the eight conductors. These guys wanted access to all, we, they wanted all eight conductors. Fortunately, I found that two of the conductors were used just to tell when a remote device, uh, a remote, remote USB device was unplugged and the, system, and, and the USB needed to be re-enumerated. So you could detect, oh, I've unplugged it, I need to re-enumerate when I plug it back in. Well, these systems never get unplugged. The whole thing's sealed. You power it up once, it stays powered up. So uh, logically, I thought, we can, we can just not use those, those, those particular connections. Get it down to six wires, and we have enough to make this work. And it did work for the first 10 days. And then a lightning bolt. <laughs> That's literally what happened. We don't get, uh, if you know weather on the West Coast, we don't get lightning storms. They are really strange. We got a doozy. Um, and it reset everything on the float, including this guy, which immediately wanted to re-enumerate. <laughs> And couldn't, because it couldn't signal back to the, to the low end. So make a long story short, we waited. We actually could tell that the system was still working. We knew that we were going to go out and recover the whole thing, but, we could, but the rest of the mooring came back. That is, the other parts of the mooring came back. And they had a sensor that could see that the pump that we were operating to sample was running at the right time. So we knew that the ESP was actually running, although we couldn't communicate with it. So we decided to sit tight and wait. And sure enough, after 10 days of nervous waiting, this thing synced up again, and we had communication. Everything was all right. When we went out the next time this year, in fact, this system is, is deployed, deployed again right now, we, have, uh, we, we, you know, we learned our lesson. We have a, a mechanism for resetting both ends of this connection. So if we get another bolt from the blue, we might survive it better. I was going to talk. I think most of you realize there, there are problems with USB and power management. The theory and the practice um, are, are a little bit, there's a, a big gulf between theory and practice. We found the most, the, most, um, the most practical method was simply to cut off the USB power. If we needed to, to, power, to power manage a device, there are all these the right way to do things. They don't work. They just aren't supported. The way that works is to simply shut off the USB power, cut off its plus five, and then the USB stack handles it beautifully. It sees, when you, when you shut off the power, it sees it as a disconnect. You turn on the power, it sees it as a connect. It doesn't know that this is happening. It's not being coordinated anywhere in the kernel, but it works. Um, there's no need, we found, luckily, there's no need to splice the high-speed data lines, because those are impedance control. That would, be, that would be tough. But we didn't need to do that at all. Finally, let's talk a little bit about energy harvesting. I mean, I think um, we're, I'm sitting here worrying about 2 milliwatts here, 5 milliwatts here. I take, off, I take off LEDs off of circuit boards because, well, that's 
three milliwatts that I don't need to spend, and there's nobody in that dark case to look at it. So um, why not just solve the problem, sorry, solve the problem with, um, with, a, with a little solar panel? And in fact, we could do that. It wouldn't be that hard. A, 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 we've never done this yet, but we need, we're looking into it. A, square, a quarter square meter of solar panel would give us 50 watt hours a day, and that would, take, that would allow us to run forever. We could sit there and monitor. We wouldn't give up monitoring the environment. We could sit there and, and operate forever. But our little floats that we have, those would probably have to be made a little larger, because even that small solar panel on those tiny floats would tend to, would tend to tip them over in the wind. And if they tip over, then the antennas don't work so well. So to recap, um, we have, we got there, we got, we got, to, we got to this point uh, um, by, first of all, identifying a very low-tech but, but um, uh, very high-energy battery type, and then doing some custom electronics. So we have, first, first we were concerned about the active power consumption, but probably we spent too much worrying about that. We should have been more worried about the passive power consumption, that is the power consumption between samples. We finally addressed that years later. Um, but in all of this, the real message that I got out of it that surprised me most was how important it is to, to, to look at the, the actual communications uh, power consumption. In modern designs, I think that's safe to say that's going to be more and more, it's going to be the, the focus of energy management. And to, to get to the rest of it, I mean, Basically, I don't think I need to go through this again. We, we talked about it. And if we want to do, th if, and, the, and, and if you really want to stay out there indefinitely, you're going to have to do something to, to, to get the, to get the um, energy out of the environment. We have, to, we have to do some energy harvesting. So hopefully I have a few minutes for questions. Yeah, I did all right. Okay. Um, I'm, questions, comments, raw fruit. Yes. Do you want to get, you know, do we can do the microphone thing? Are we a small enough group we can just talk? Tides? Okay, I, 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 yes, I, I, you could, we could use wind, we could use, uh, wind is a, a, a excellent, and we could use currents. All those mechanisms involve, well, they're mechanisms. They, they convert physical energy to electrical energy. You've got moving parts exposed to the ocean, and they are not likely to support, they're not likely to support, thank you, they're not likely to, they won't, the thought was that they wouldn't likely last uh, a year without any maintenance. So the, we thought we really think that the solar has a better chance. In fact, we have it in Bari, uh, a group that is trying to do exactly that, and so we know how challenging that is. Um, to, um, there may be some instances where it works, but in, in general, it, we, we found that it, it's, a me it's a mechanical system and it can break. Uh, I'm thinking about mechanical washers. Like those are mechanical washers. They are meant to go on for years. But they don't, they don't live in the... In the, in the um, in the ocean, they don't actually live in the ocean, which which corrodes everything, and they don't. They're not exposed to all the different. Uh, they're not exposed to weather, so I, I I would be willing to consider it. But that was our initial reaction. We can talk more about it. Yes. In the last example, why, why didn't we choose our response? Oh, that's a good question. Um, because the uh, because we could have. Um, but the, uh, we, when we tried the system with the R, based on RS-422, the problem with that is it needs a lot of conductors. Uh, you, it, it, it uses two conductors for every one conductor that RS-232 uses. It's a differential signaling, and we didn't have enough conductors. We only had six lines available to us. So with the handshakes that we needed for the modem and everything, we just ran out of conductors. And also, they, the, 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 the University of Washington would like the USB idea or, some, or a network because they could then add uh, additional um, devices on the float. If we, if we got it to work with RS-422, it's pretty closed. You can't just throw another device on there. Yes? Do we have any vandalism or overrunning over? Do I have any what? Vandalism. Uh, vandalism. Oh, you know, luckily we have, we have, we had one that was struck by something that suddenly pulled it down 20 meters. And we don't know still what did it. It could have been a whale. Um, but no, we haven't had any confirmed vandalism. The people in, Wa in Washington, University of Washington, they had their moorings stripped clean, and they still don't know what did it. So it's, it, it, there's, some, there's some suspicion there, but we don't have proof. 
Yes, it's, uh, that's an issue. That's an issue. That's part of the reason we, keep, we want to keep the floats small. If they're that small, the seals just can't, can't get on it. They just sit there, it goes away. It's no fun for them. <laughs> okay. Yes, in the back. Yeah? No, I, I, it, was, it was not easy to solve. It wasn't the, the, it wasn't the focus of the talk. Um, the, the motors, what we developed our own uh, low-power motor controller, it, and they, uh, that whole networking, we, we networked them together with I squared C on a multi-master bus. That took months. That took four months of my time. <laughs> um, so it, that was many years ago. I'm, I'm glad it's behind me. Um, Yes. Um, did you investigate uh, broader reach Ethernet for the communication? I mean, it would, uh, would need a second system as well, but broader reach that automotive uh, physical layer, which, is, uh, which works on grilled cables? Uh, a broader reach? Broader reach. I, I'm hearing, the question is, did we look at a broader reach Ethernet? Yeah. I'm not aware of that. I, I, I guess you can talk to me about that. If the, I would love to find out if any of you people if any of you folks know about copper, um, copper uh, line transceivers that, that, will, that will cover you know, 100 meters or 50 meters and, and don't draw uh, a ha more than a watt or a half a watt, I'd be really interested. Because what the strange situ situation we have right now is I can take a wireless signal and broadcast it 100 meters with less power than I need for Ethernet. It's, you th that's not intuitive, but that's the fact. that's the fact. So, any other questions? Yeah. Well, compared to the RS-422, you have 485, which is only two colors. No, that, that has just as many. The 485 is a party line system. That with the 485, you could conceivably have multiple drops, and that would be a way to, ha to ex add expandability to the float. It's not nearly as standardized as USB. But if I was, but but it could be done that way. But the but each um, each drop needs to have the minus and the plus for the data. So it has just as many wires. If you want, it, it can be duplex or, or not, but, but in all cases, for every data signal, you've got two, two wires, a plus and a minus, which USB has, by the way, too. It's just they managed to put everything on just one pair. Yeah. What would be? The one wire protocol. The, you know, I admit I have, I am, I've heard of it, but I haven't looked at that really well. And if you like one wire and you think I should look at it, we can talk. Um, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I, I'm, I, uh, we don't, we, I mean, the, the USB is, is faster than we need. If we had, if we had, uh, if we had a, a reliably 100, 100 kilobits a second up, up to the float, that would be enough. Okay. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Okay. Yeah. Uh, how many floats are currently employed? Oh, excellent question. Okay. There are there are about twenty five of these in existence, um, and at this moment we have four that are deployed. There are there's uh, two off the coast, off the uh, west coast. I think there are three off the west coast, and there's one in the Great Lakes. Um, there was a there was a big um, a couple of years ago there was a uh, Toledo, Ohio had, Ohio had to shut off their water because they had so much algae in the, uh, in the lakes, and this happens every year. And so now there's actually government money to investigate that and try, and so there's a group there, that government group that's using it to, uh, to monitor the, the lakes. So there's one out there. Yes? How often do you sample the environment? What, what the frequency? You know, the, the scientists want to do it every 20 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and I, we have this push and pull when I'm sit, we're sitting there penciling out, look, you, you need a, you know, you'll need a, a, a Honda generator out there to do that. So, um, the, but uh, we, usually, we, usually can, we usually can agree on f once for every five minutes, ten minutes, depending on how. It's, it's strange. You, the algae are in little, little, sh little waves, and, and so it's not that the algae are like growing really fast, but the water is moving. And so we're in one spot, and the current's moving by us. And so we, we kind of need to know when to grab, when to, when to take that sample. And uh, I was very skeptical, as you are, 
about needing to sample every five minutes. And then I saw the plots. I saw the raw data. And, yeah, it's there. I mean, you, 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 sample it, you sample it 10 minutes, and you can see that there's, you're, you're getting Nyquist effects. You're just missing things. So they made me a believer. OK, I think, how are we doing for time? I guess we, well, it's up to you guys. I still have a few more minutes. <laughs> um, are we good? So you're talking about sampling the environmental, the environmental sample? Yes, we, we, do, we do statistics on the samples, yeah. Um, we actually, the environmental sampler, that the, the electronic sampler, the thing that's looking at chlorophyll and looking at, um, at, at, at salinity, that is a little uh, microcontroller in its own right, and it's doing a lot of statistics. And we take that information and do some more statistics. Um, the, by, I haven't mentioned it in this talk, but the whole system is programmed in Ruby, of all things. Um, it, uh, that allows the scientists to actually write these scripts. And, um, and so they can, write, they can write scripts where they, sp they specify what we call trigger conditions. And they, s they can write out in pretty much English when the, when the chlorophyll is greater than this threshold and the salinity is less than this threshold, you know, proceed and do a sample. So th that's, so we, yeah, we do, we do all our basic statistics. Nothing too, nothing too technical, but the basic stuff. Uh, in the back, right here. Um, is the design in a source that we will build? <laughs> um, for everything that we've done with open source, in terms of the, uh, the kernel, we've done a little work on the kernels, but these are old kernels. Uh, I just put that out there. Uh, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm a total believer. Uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the stuff that, like, the, the, um, the, we've modified the Ruby interpreter. The, all that information is, is online. Uh, you can look up uh, Ambari Ruby patches, and you'll find all that work on a Google page and with all the code. Um, and there's a Git repository for that. But for the actual Ruby scripting, the, 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 what the scientists write to actually deploy and run a mission, that's considered proprietary because it's, it's really their work. I, I'm thinking more of the hardware. Oh, the hardware. Um, the issue there is, if you are interested in the hardware, Ambari is a research uh, group. Uh, they're a nonprofit. We really can't sell it. Um, but we are always looking for um, t uh, partners. In fact, the ESP, is in, it's in, in its entirety, is made by a group in the West Coast, uh, a separate company. So if you're interested in this hardware and want to want to market it or work with it, um, all I can say is talk to me, and likely we would be willing to license it to you. There's, there's, um, but, but, in but the hardware, it's not open source in terms of, it is, our, it is proprietary, it is ours. Um, but we don't particularly, we don't intend to market it. And we'd love to find somebody else who would be like to do that. Okay, that might be a good place to stop. <laughs> All right, thanks, thanks for your attention.